Eagles Entertainment. Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Everything didn't move. I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. Touchdown! You're listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Brand Duffy. That's right of the week, and we're talking DB plays. The Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, continues. I'm Fran Duffy, and as always, I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 238. At the top of this week's show, we've got Chalk Talk, where I chat with a couple of guests this week again. First up, got Eagles defensive backs coach Marquand Manuel, and, and not only do we talk about Darius Slay and Will Parks and how they're going to fit into this Eagles scheme, but we talk about coaching up a player's ball skills, the importance of tackling in the secondary in today's league, and what it actually means to be a positionless player at defensive back. I feel like that's a theme we've talked about so much so far this offseason, but we'll continue that with Coach Manuel. After that, we get into a little bit of a national perspective here from my friend Matt Bowen, former NFL defensive back, now one of the best analysts in the game, overall on the NFL Matchup Show with Greg Cosell. Matt and I talk about a new-look Eagles secondary, what it takes to make the conversion from corner to safety, and a whole lot more. But let's not waste any more time. Let's get into our chat now. It's time for Chalk Talk. Let's get down to business. It's time for Chalk Talk. Well, really excited to welcome into the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, Eagles defensive backs coach, Marquand Manuel. Coach, uh, welcome to the show. Hey, appreciate you guys having me, man. So let's talk about it. We, we've got a couple DBs we're going to talk about here today. We'll talk about uh, Darius Slay. We'll talk about Will Parks, two of the new Eagles here uh, in the fold. Then also uh, a couple of the guys you haven't had a co- chance to coach yet, but you've been able to study them on film uh, with Jalen Mills and Rodney McLeod. But uh, let's start off with Darius Slay. He's the name that I think a lot of Eagles fans want to hear more about. Uh, give us your scouting report on Darius Slay and what you've seen from him over the course of his NFL career. I oh, mean, when you watch a guy who came in and, um, you know, he's all, you always, already was a, a – a raw talent and when I say that uh the speed the skill set of the things that he's capable of doing but also uh his maturation process over the years in this league and when you watch a guy like that not only because uh he's a he's a natural t- gifted talent talented guy but how he's now enhanced his name and one of the the guys that comes in and every time you see a star receiver, he's lined up against him. And that's basically what he's become, a guy that knows how to uh, not only cover, he can cover outside, inside. And I think that's one of the things that you have to value when you're looking at a, a guy of of the ability to be able to call himself a lockdown corner. And I think that's ability to cover not only on the left, not only on the right, the number one receiver lines in up, up in the slot. He's able to do that. And he does a good a good job in the run game, no matter what position he's in. His ability to now not only stick and and close on any any receiver, his ability to to take the ball away. That's the the other part of how we talk about defense turning into offense. He does a good job at that as well. All right, so we've talked about Darius Slay, Coach. Now I want to ask you about safety Will Parks. And uh, this guy has been a very versatile player throughout his course in the NFL. I'm really interested to hear uh, what your scouting report is on him. Tell Eagles fans, what can they expect to see from the veteran safety on the field this fall? What stands out to you most about him on film? He has the small intangibles. You, you said it, his versatility. I think one of the things that a lot of people don't understand on the back end, you have to be versatile. Not only be able to play in the running game, but we have to defend defend the passing game as well. And he does a he's he's continuously uh, when you watch him on tape, he has done a great job of going in and playing multiple positions, succeeding at man coverage, playing in the run game, uh, defending the run, understanding gap integrity, understanding coverage. Uh, does a good job leading the the guys, uh, uh, Justin Simmons and those guys that he was around. So. He brings that to the table. And then you've got Rodney McLeod as well uh, coming back uh, to play that safety spot. Uh, what have you seen from Rodney uh, from watching him on film? Well, Rodney has done a good job of being the field general, the racer. Um, even when Malcolm was there, he was like, you know, the glue that you know, Batman and Robin, uh, when you look at it. But he has always stood in the, uh, one of the hardest things a lot of people don't understand is at that position, being consistent is really hard. Um, because you have to erase a lot of mistakes that happen. And he's done a great job of that. 
Um, I thought one of the things that, you know, especially bringing him back, he's been a, a part of the defense. He's been there with the, the, the good and the bad. He's also understand understood that it's it's the leadership in the room and on the practice field that, that now trans, translates into what happens on Sunday. So I think just the skill set that he brings, and, you know, there's always room for every one of those guys to improve. And I think as we now collectively start doing it together, uh, the sky's the limit. All right, Coach, the next guy I want to ask you about uh, is going to be Jalen Mills, a, a player that uh, Eagles fans are very, very familiar with. And, uh, you know, Howie Roseman recently talked with uh, the Philadelphia media, and they, they, he talked about him as a positionless player. And he mentioned that, uh, obviously, in a good way. Um, what stands out uh, about Jalen Mills, his skill set, and his ability to possibly play uh, multiple positions uh, for you guys in the Eagles secondary? I think that that that's how he hit it on the head, man. Um, that's one of the things that when you look at a player, his stature, Six feet, 195 pounds. Uh, you go back. You're talking like the rare, the rare breeds of not comparing them to B. Dalt, but the ability to play nickel, strong safety, corner, free safety. Um, when you add that capability, you now have a guy that can now just be basically the star of your defense. Meaning that he can now line up and cover anybody in any position and play any position at any given time, which uh, he lose to the other side of his skill set. You know, his ability to cover receivers if he lined up outside, his ability to uh, stop the run in the run game, his ability to cover tight ends because he's not a little guy. And now, you know, you have these running backs that actually play slot receiver that lines up everywhere. So you got a guy that has a combination skill set to do it all. Coach, when we talk about defensive back play, one word that we constantly talk about, but on this show, we talk about it in Philadelphia all the time, is, you know, competitiveness and urgency. When you talk about those traits and those qualities in a defensive back, why are they so important at that position? Well, understanding this, that we're, we're reactive. And as you're reacting, you now have to understand that we have to go a step harder than a wide receiver or running back that knows exactly where they're going. Um, you have to anticipate, but also be detailed. And I think in the combination of all those guys having that skill set, I think that's where – as a defender, you know, I know we see it more on our end, but as a defender, you have to have those traits and be competitive because sometimes, just like when you go up to bat, you may strike out. How do you bounce back and respond to it? Because, again, like I said, we're in a reactive position, so we now have to react in order to defend what's going on in front of us. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's something that we've always seen too from, uh, you know, at least from what I've seen from Nikel Roby Coleman as well, who uh, the Eagles brought in uh, late last week as well. Uh, what have you seen from Roby Coleman over the course of his career? Uh, you know, he has one of those skills. He's, he's a feisty little player um, that, you know, he comes in, he, he's played the game for a while, going back and forth. Um, but what you see his skill set, most guys in this league, when you understand of mastering one thing that I do, he does a really good job inside. He does a good job when he's blitzing, not afraid to be in the run game. And I've always called these active players. What I mean by active is activity at the point of attack, his ability to get the ball from off the uh, the offensive players. You know, he's very active from that standpoint. Yeah, I feel like he's one of those guys that's always kind of mixing it up. Jalen Mills, certainly one of those guys. Um, you know, you talk about, especially in today's NFL, I, I think it's always been the case, but, you know, one thing that's always talked about now is the importance for defensive backs to, whether it's safety, corner, or nickel, uh, you know, to be able to finish one on one as a tackler because of, you know, jet sweeps and the wide receiver screen game, everything that's done out in the perimeter. Those guys have got to be able to finish one on one. Is that something you feel like is more important now, or has it always been important and now it's just more? in the limelight for us uh, on the outside in the media? Well, it's more important. It's more important. Uh, you know, one of the number one things that we always talk about being the ability to be able to stay on top and defend and understand what combinations that you're possibly going to see. Um, I think most of the time that, you know, when you go out there and you're playing with the familiarity of guys that played together for a long periods of time, you know, that cohesiveness that happens, you start to trust one another. And with, like I said, that has to come over a period of time that we now start that communication um, factor. 
Yeah, that's one of the things. Like you, you mentioned it with Rodney earlier, how he's you know the eraser and uh, you know his ability to just coming from distance, you know, coming from the back end, be able to kind of run the alley and finish one on one. He's always been so consistent in that role. And you know, how hard is that to be able to teach a guy if he doesn't have it? You know, we're that we're at the time of the year in the spring uh, where we're talking college prospects and projecting guys from college to the NFL in terms of the NFL draft. For a guy that maybe didn't have that experience or wasn't particularly good at that at the college level, is that something that's really difficult to be able to teach, like the pacing and the timing and the angles of being able to come from depth and be able to finish one-on-one? No, I wouldn't say that. Um, I think one of the things that translate is when we factor in 40 times game speed, things of that nature, you also factor in instincts, awareness, um, those things get factored in as well. Sure. I believe, you know, when we ask a guy to do certain things, you won't put him in a compromising position, which now eludes to, okay, he does this great, not having the OTAs or if it goes to that point, not sure if it will or not. But the practice time, it's like any veteran. I've been that guy. Practice time is always important. But as much as you can do visually, it's the same learning curve, uh, understanding mm-hmm play entry. You know, that's the main focus. If you can understand play entry, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each coverage? I think that also propels a guy that's coming in that might not have much playing time from another team or might not have that position in college. So I think it's just a combination of the two, but I think visually guys learn, you know, this is a new wave of technology these days. And I think, you know, I I wish I had it. I'm I'm upset and jealous a little (laughs) because it's, uh, and, you know, honestly, it's a, it's, a, it's a good new learning tool for these guys. You know, it's, we call it, you know, play 60 for the young kids. But now professionals can now sit at home at a touch of a button and look at everything that they need to look at. How can they make themselves better? Um, I think, you know, in the NBA and the uh, NBL, everyone's starting to do that now. The devices that now are live and impactful are now enhancing our not only uh, learning curve, but now the ability to get better from it. Are there things that are that are tougher than others to be able to to kind of improve and get better at it? Whether it's at, at safety or at corner, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say things that are tougher because you know guys that come in running four threes uh, in the forty. By the time they're at year ten, they still look fast, but I guarantee if you put them on the clock, they're not running four threes. <laughs> um, so I think it's more instinctive. Um, I think the learning curve of how fast, and I've always said this, I've always been taught by the coaches, my coaches, how fast can you slow this process down? Mm. You know, that was one of the things that, you know, going from Coach Schwartz to every coach that I've had, how fast can you slow this process down? And now understanding what I slowed down, what's about to happen to me, my anticipation level is going to be a little higher. And now I can go out and make the play that not only that I'm supposed to make, the one that I'm anticipating as well. Yeah, I feel like that's uh, one of those things that, you know, I think fans and media like us on the outside, we don't always take that into account, especially with young players is, you know, just the the change in the speed of the game and the the impact that can have. Some guys, uh, you know, take to it like a, a duck to water and others, it, it takes a little bit longer uh, to be able to get that, to make that adjustment. They can make it, but it just takes a little bit longer. Um, I, I always, I like talking with, uh, with defensive backs and with defensive back coaches about just ball skills in general and just the, the, that term. And like, is it something that, uh, I, I, I feel like I know which direction you're going to go here, but you know, some people will say that it's, that it's teachable and some guys will say, yeah, you know what, you either have ball skills or you don't, uh, where do you kind of fall you know, on ball skills and how do you define a guy that, that has good ball skills? Well, I'm, I'm going to help you out. And this is another way that I always answer it when I'm evaluating a guy, it's ball skills and it's ball awareness. Okay. All right. Okay, ball skills is what you were talking about. The ability to be able to catch it, pluck it, pull it out the air, and find it, tuck it away, and this guy had seven career picks in two years or in a year. Ball awareness, guy's pretty good. He can knock it down, find it. He can locate it, but he struggles at catching it. Mm. Some things are natural for certain guys. Always one of the comparisons is, Offense and defense. You tell a guy who used to play offense or a guy that plays offense as a wide receiver, you can catch seven out of ten and you can't catch. 
on defense, if we catch seven out of 10, that's a pretty good day. And one of the things that you have to now is understand you can't really enhance a guy on making them be able to relax and catch, but you can teach a guy how to play. What we have to catch as defenders is the blur of a football. What do I mean? Last we checked, the wide receiver and the quarterback are in sync. We as defenders are playing a blur of what we may see and think that is the football. So that is a teachable skill to be able to see the blur. And now here's the other part of what I'm saying, the awareness. You may knock it down. The natural skills, ball skills, you'll pick it off. So you can enhance ball awareness. I think it's really difficult at times to enhance ball skills. Um, rarely see it, but you can enhance awareness to locate the football. And I, I guess that goes back to what you were saying earlier too about um, you know how fast can we slow this down? There are some guys that you know they're they're out of phase. They're trying to get back hip to hip, get back in phase with the receiver down the field, and you know they've got the wherewithal. To, All right, now I'm back in phase. I can turn back, find the football, go up, make the play, finish at the catch point. Some guys, it, it's just like you said, it, you. Maybe you can come back and uh, get a hand on it and get the ball on the ground, but uh, it can be a little bit tougher for those guys, um, you know, if they if they're not playing as fast or able to slow the game down as well. Well, Coach Manuel, really appreciate the time here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. Uh, we'll, we'll talk to you again soon. Hopefully, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later here in Philadelphia. Hey, man, pray all is well. Everyone be safe. Thank you, man. Awesome stuff there from Coach Manuel. Really, really enjoyed that conversation. I hope you guys are getting a sense of the kind of coach the Eagles are getting back there in the secondary with him. Love the breakdown there regarding ball skills and how he views the separation of finding the ball versus just playing it in the air. And I thought he made some really great points as well on the versatility part of playing the position. Just really great stuff there from Coach Manuel. All right, let's get to the next part of Chalk Talk. This week, the great Matt Bowen joined us to talk about the discussion you know, with the defensive back play in today's NFL. Let's get to that chat right now. Well, fired up to welcome into the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. Again, my friend Matt Bowen. You can follow Matt on Twitter at MattBowen41. You can check him out, uh, obviously, for ESPN on the NFL Matchup Show with our friend Greg Cosell. Well, Matt, uh, let's get started, man. I- I'm really excited to get your take on uh, Darius Slay, the Eagles' new star cornerback, uh, obviously acquired via trade earlier this offseason. What are your thoughts on Slay in, ter- in terms of how he stacks up against some of the other top corners in the league, and what exactly are the Eagles getting in that player? Well, I think you look at it this way, Fran. I always look at, especially free agency and now as we're getting into the draft as well, how do players fit your scheme and fit what you want to do from a defensive profile or defensive identity? When you look at the Eagles film, even the film and the numbers, how often they're in man coverage, how often they're in single high safety defenses. So it's cover one, man free, cover three. They play a lot of cover three. Slay's an ideal fit for that. We know he's an upgrade, okay? We know he's an upgrade because you can go back last year and look at the tape against Miami and what Devontae Parker did to the corners outside and how Miami took advantage, basically just one-on-one matchups. That was not that was my players are going to win this matchup. We know you're in single high. We know you're going to play a lot of cover one and cover three. We're going to attack your corners outside. Let's look at the tape and say, well, how do we get better? Well, you get better going out and get one of the top man coverage corners, in my opinion, in the National Football League. And you look at traits. Darius Slay, you start with the footwork, excellent footwork to mirror in the slide versus the release of a wide receiver. You look at the hands, aggressive hands, the on-the-ball production. Okay, that's what you want in a corner, someone who can mirror, match, and press covers, and also have the smooth pedal, square shoulders to play, and off-man, which you get from Slay, but also the ability to finish plays. And I think you'd look back at his tape going back to last year and years beyond that. That's the type of corner you're getting. And the, here's another thing I like about him. Think about this, friend. Whenever you watch Detroit play in the past, where is Darius Slay? Matched up, want number one, number one man receiver. Yep. Is that <laughs> you got to be ultra competitive to do that? You have to want to do that. You know, and if I'm a defensive back coach, those are the guys I want to coach. Give me the guy that wants to go best versus best every week, and you understand that. Look, when you match up against the best every week, and you look around the National Football League, you know, against guys like Julio, DeAndre Hopkins, Amari Cooper. When you go against the best, you're not going to make every play. You understand that as a coach, you understand that as a player. But you want him to win more than he loses, and that's what you get with Slay, someone who's going to battle and compete all game long. I really like the move. Again, scheme-specific move 
that fits the identity of what Jim Schwartz and that Eagles defense wants to be from a coverage perspective. Well, that's why I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought up that last point too, Matt, because you, know, you talk about competitiveness in the secondary. Uh, you know, Jalen Mills has always been that guy, right? He's always been. You know, I go back to his rookie year, and you know, the Eagles are playing the Steelers at home. Uh, you know, week three of the season, and he's matched up on Antonio Brown. He matched up on Julio Jones that season. I mean, uh, you know, and he you're you're going to take your lumps against those kind of guys, but uh, you know, Jalen has always kind of had that swagger, that competitiveness to him, uh, and it seems like in his new role that you know he talked about that uh, recently you know for philadelphiaeagles.com and for uh, you know philadelphia media just kind of talk about he'll be able to be that kind of a matchup player talk about that that kind of position a guy that can you know kind of travel around the field you know whether it's against a tight end or a bigger receiver inside to be able to match up on those guys one on one maybe even a dynamic running back out of the backfield it seems like most of those guys are playing safety whether it's a corner or safety doesn't necessarily matter uh, in today's game but uh, what are your what's your take on that kind of a role for Jalen Mills I think he'll be a better fit in, in the Eagles' defense in that role. I think he'll play better in space. Okay, I really believe that. Better in space, what I mean, just go back to what you just said. The ability to match up in the slot, the ability to match up to versus the tight end, the ability to match up versus the running back, whether he's attached to the formation in the backfield or flexed outside. That, to have those traits, you have to be able to play in space. Obviously, you have to be able to play a two-way go. Understand that when you're playing in space – you don't have the protection of the sideline anymore. We all know that. And, and you ask any corner, that's a great thing to have. You want the protection of the side. When you don't, it's tough. But you have to have traits that allow you to play with lateral change of direction ability, great eyes, and great closing speed. I think, I think Jalen Mills will be a better fit for this defense in that type of role. And, again, for Jim Schwartz, a guy you can move around to play specific matches. And I think that's – if you look at, Fran, what they've done this offseason through free agency, that's what it's all been about. Mm-hmm. Look at the guys they've added in the secondary. Will Parks. Will Parks did that for Denver. He played a, a lot of different spots. Again, versatile traits. They give you schematical advantages from a coaching perspective when it comes to game day based on your specific opponent that week. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that. I was going to ask you about Will Parks next, and you, just kind of talking about keeping the conversation going about these versatile players. Uh, one topic, you know, I it was back at the combine. Greg and I uh, had a discussion on this podcast about positionless football, and you know what it looks like from an offensive standpoint and a defensive standpoint. I mean, you're talking about what it looks like in the secondary with guys that can travel uh, and match up with a, a variety of skill sets on the offensive side of the ball. When you look at Jalen Mills, you look at Will Parks, you look at Avante Maddox. Uh, they bring in Nikel Roby Coleman. They've got Straff, uh, Le- uh, you know, uh, Craven LeBlanc. I mean, they've got all these guys that can match up inside, that can do some things outside, match up against a wide variety of, of skill sets. What does that do for, for a defense to allow you to be? I guess it just allows you to be able to have answers for whatever the offense is going to throw at you. Yeah, answers to their personnel. You don't have to change. I, I don't think Philadelphia is going to come out and all of a sudden be a completely different defense. You know, Jim Schwartz is going to say, well, we're going to start over and you know, teach a new defense. I don't believe that at all. I think you play the same defense. But what you're doing is you're upgrading the talent of the defense. You're upgrading the versatility to match to whatever you get. You get 11 personnel, heavy 11 personnel one week, you, you can match to that. You get more 12 personnel the next week, you can match those two tight ends in the field that can be route runners and guys that can stretch the seams. That's what you're getting here with the additions they've made this offseason to take your scheme and upgrade the talent, the versatile traits to match anything the offense throws at you. So, you know, we talked about Jalen Mills and kind of making that potential conversion, you know, if he were to go, if he was going to line up uh, from corner last year to potentially safety uh, moving forward. I guess for for some guys, uh, that can be a little bit concerning, right? Because if you haven't done it before, but with Jalen, uh, with how he was used at LSU, I know you evaluated him coming out of college. He played all over the field uh, for the LSU Tigers throughout the course of his career. So he's got that uh, kind of in his toolbox. But overall, you know, taking Jalen aside, I just want to ask you kind of big picture. When you're looking at a guy that has to make that move from corner to safety what does that look like what what does that entail and how hard can you know that transition be for some guys it could be challenging for guys because i think the angles are different i always talk about secondary play in terms of angles and now you're taking more inside out angles to the football whether you're playing in the post or whether you're as a curl defender or you're dropping down as a robber safety in the middle of the field you're taking different angles to the football obviously tackling is key uh look I, i'm a big believer in tackling whether we're talking high school football or National Football League. If I'm coaching the secondary, I want guys that are physical and can tackle, but it's different tackling. Now you're running the alley more. Now you may be rolled down as a cover three defender versus a run that bounces to the outside. You have to be able to cut off the football, turn it back inside to your defensive help, 
and also tackle more in space. So that's also the challenge a lot of guys who say, well, I'm going to make the transition from corner to safety. It, it sounds great. And the athletic traits are always there. They're always there when, uh, when you're talking about corners that can move and play in the post or play down in the front. But it's the tackling, the physicality, also the eyes. You know, your eye, you look, think about this, right? You're looking at different things. You're matched up in man coverage as a corner. Hey, uh, your eyes are on your work, right? You know what you're getting. You're covering your guy right in front of your face. But the safety could change sometimes. You have to be able to play play action, understand what high hat, low hat means. High hat. Offensive lineman stands straight up with the pass. Low hat, they're driving out to run. I mean, it sounds easy. It sounds simple. Uh, but it's not because of all the play action and the movement and the pre-snap motion we see from NFL offenses today. So there's a lot that goes into that transition. Uh, if we're just taking, you know, a, a wide look at this thing. But for someone like Mills, who's played uh, a lot of positions going back to his college days, I think the transition will be much smoother than someone who hasn't had that in their resume before. Yeah, I, th- I just wanted to ask you that because you know a lot of fans will say like, oh, why can't you know they move this guy to safety, move this guy to safety? It's it's a lot more than just uh, you know changing what position room the guy's going to go to for meetings. There's a lot that goes into it. So I'm glad you brought uh, all those things up. So it's the time of year, Matt, where we're talking you know projecting college guys to the NFL. So I just want to ask you a couple, uh, just a couple of overarching questions with DB play, and uh, you know especially when talking about projecting guys from college to the league. And the first thing I want to ask you, and I guess it's a two-part question, both for corner and for safety in today's game, what's the most important athletic trait for, for both of those positions in your mind? Well, I think right now at the cornerback position is having man coverage traits or man coverage ability. I think that's where the league's going. Uh, you look at the Eagles offensively. What do you have to take away? Quick game, RPO, play action. You need man coverage guys to do that. And look, we saw last year, great examples of 49ers, more zone-based team. You know, I think they are 65% zone coverage last year, and it you know, went all the way to the Super Bowl. I mean, I'm not saying that playing zone coverage is wrong. Zone coverage, if you do it well, you can win a lot of football games still. But what I see is if I'm looking at projecting corners to the next level and I'm a scout right now, I want guys that can cover. Simple as that. I want guys that have man coverage traits that are super competitive, that can play press man, play off man, weave, pedal, keep the shoulder square, and drive in the football. I think that's really what you need. At the safety position, I think you need to check, you know, two or three boxes right now, really three. You need to have the ability to play in the post. You need to have the ability to play in the run front and blitz. You also have to have the ability to play out in the slot. You know, we see so many teams now that play, you know, what you could call big nickel, okay? Big nickels, mm-hmm. you have three safeties in the field. You know, instead of bringing in your fifth defensive back who's a slot corner, you bring in a safety who's got slot coverage ability. doesn't mean he's a slot corner. I'm saying he's got slot coverage ability where he can roll down over a slot or a flex tight end or a flex running back, play that man coverage uh, technique, and also be able to – to transition onto the football. That means come out of your pedal, close the speed, drive to the upfield shoulder, and make a play in the football. So I think the position is changing consistently uh, in the National Football League, but again, it goes back to those man coverage traits. If you have that at the safety position, a guy that has that versatility, then that gives you, again, more flexibility within your defensive game plan to, to play specific matchups. And we're out, look when you're evaluating these guys from college, you know, to the NFL. They all have got weaknesses, right? They've all there because otherwise they'd all be the number one pick. They've all got issues they want to try and fix. So I want to ask you this: when you're watching these guys, and, and you can decide if you want to go corner or safety with this answer, what's the hardest thing to fix, and what's the easiest thing to fix? When you're watching these guys, all right, like I could fix this in an off season. I could fix this in a week of practice. We could fix this in camp. And some things are like, man, like this is a non-negotiable. I'm not going to be able to fix what the issues that this guy has. Both position guys that, that make plays in the ball. I think it's the mm-hmm. hardest thing to fix. I think that's yeah. a natural trait. I, I really do. Look, I, I take one, <clears throat> Fran, when I played in the league, I had uh, a thousand weaknesses, all right? I wasn't very good. Okay? <laughs> I, I, fooled, I fooled teams for seven years, okay? And one of the things I, I did not do, I, I didn't make plays in the ball, okay? I, I simply didn't, okay? I think it's a natural trait that, that people have uh, the ability to finish plays ability to be around the football and that doesn't happen by action i'm always to this you know i had a discussion a while ago it was i can't remember who we were talking about but it was a safety had seven or eight picks and, and someone said well you know five of them were tip passes i said well you know what there were tip passes that he finished because he was around the football he was doing what he's supposed to do he was driving the ball before it was thrown you don't make plays by action in, in the national football you simply don't 
You go down the lower level. It's the same thing. Guys that are around the football have this natural trait, and you can't really teach that to someone. Can you work on their technique? Sure. Can you work on their pedals, a corner? Of course. Can you work on their hand placement, a press man, their ability to motor mirror and, and to weave with the release off the line of scrimmage. That's all stuff you drill every day. I call them everyday drills from a coaching perspective. And you have to do that. That's part of your, that's part of your resume as a defensive back. You have to mas- master those movements. But you can't, you can't just take a college kid and say, well, I'm going to make him into someone who gets seven or eight picks playing outside the National Football League. It's not that easy. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, to me, that's one of the most I, I love asking uh, whether it's former players, current players, coaches about ball skills. You know, we talked earlier uh, about it with Mark Juan Manuel is just the, you know, the, the act of, of finding the ball and then the ability to then make a play on it. Uh, I think that to me, like the, the ball skills are such a, a very polarizing topic. When you talk with some guys are like, oh, yeah, you could definitely, uh, you know, drill that and get a little bit better. I think that most people kind of fall in your camp of you either. That's a natural skill that you're born with, uh, the ability to kind of find it and locate it and, and make a play. Um, so no, that's a, a great point that you brought up. Last thing I want to ask you, and you wrote, you actually just wrote a piece um, for ESPN on best team fits, and you pegged LSU wide receiver uh, Justin Jefferson to the Eagle. What did you like about Jefferson, and why do you love the way that he would potentially fit in Philadelphia? Well, I, well, I always look. I, what I did with this, friend, is I, I did <clears throat> sixteen wide receivers. You know, obviously, everyone understands it's a very talented wide receiver class coming out. Uh, guys, uh, you know, and, and different skill sets, different frames, different speed. I mean, it's a great class to look at. Uh, I looked at the Eagles' offense and I said, wh- where do they really need? Not, you know, an upgrade, someone that can make plays for them. And I think it's at the slot wide receiver position. I really do. When you look at this offense. The crosses they run, the mesh concepts, the inside curls, the high-low reads for Carson Wentz, the ball thrown between the numbers, ball coming out quick. You mentioned RPOs. Well, I look at Justin Jefferson and the offense he played in at the college level for Joe Brady, the former offensive coordinator at LSU who's now with the Carolina Panthers. That's a pro route tree. Okay, that's a pro route tree. And in my opinion, that's important for young wide receivers when they make the jump to the NFL. I think it's one of the hardest positions to transition to immediately and have immediate production because there's so much that goes into it. There's so many different defenses you see, press coverage that you've never seen in your life. And I look at Jefferson and that route tree he ran at LSU. I think it works immediately in the National Football League. I think he has experience running those routes. And I think he'd be an upgrade, especially as a middle of the field target for Carson Wentz. And what I'm looking at there, I don't, I don't, I don't need someone right now that can run a four three and, and run deep seam routes the whole game. I need someone that can make a play in third and seven to ten. I need someone that can get open. Someone that's got great ball skills, with Justin Jefferson has, has a big frame inside the numbers for that slot wide receiver position, who can catch the ball outside of his frame when it's not perfect on third and seven to ten. I think that's what you're looking at here. That allows you to create matchups. You also Pair that with the tight end position in Philadelphia. And it goes back to what we were talking about defensively, Fran. You're not changing the offense. What you're doing is you're adding more pieces to the offense so you can create those matchups and win in critical down and distance situations. No, well, it's a great point. It's a reason why I'd feel that Justin Jefferson uh, is one of the best players overall uh, in this class. Just a really it checks so many boxes uh, for the wide receiver position. Great stuff, Matt. I really appreciate the time uh, here once again on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. I uh, hope you and your family uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll talk to you again soon. All right, thank you, friend. Great stuff from Matt, and you could follow him on Twitter just like I do, at MattBowen41. And while you're at it, I'm at FDuffy3. That's where I post all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's and O's content that we produce at PhiladelphiaEagles.com. And you know I really appreciate everybody that promotes this podcast on all forms of social media. That is one way to support the show, but the best way is to go into Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, leave us a rating, and leave us a comment. Here's one person I want to give a quick shout-out to, and that's a dog five star review left a, a great review as well. I uh, love the podcast. It feels like he's brought out a passion that he never knew he had in the intricacies of player study and development. Really enjoy when Fran, ha- Fran has Greg Cosell on to evaluate tape and prospects. Just went on to talk about how much the sh- he enjoys the analysis on the show. Really great stuff there from a dog who also left a question. Uh, the question is, what do you think the Eagle staff can do from a player development standpoint to get these new additions ready for the season, considering the circumstances? Very curious to hear what you have to say. Love the podcast. First review of 
I've ever left for one. Keep it up. Need you guys during these uncertain times. So great question there, A-Dog. I'm actually glad you brought it up. I think when you look around the league right now, obviously, look, all every area is getting hit by this, uh, you know, by COVID-19 a little bit differently, and everybody's kind of handling it uh, a little bit differently. But across the league, all offices are closed. OTAs are, are put on hold for, uh, you know, an indefinite amount of time. So I think really the teams that have – coaching staffs and schemes that are built in place right now they're at the best advantage and that's why you look at the Eagles right now uh, you look around the NFC East the New York Giants Washington Dallas they're all bringing in new coaching staffs on both sides of the football so not only do the new additions have to learn what's going on but the entire team has got to learn what's going on now Luckily for every team, you know, with technology being what it is now, uh, the reason why I'm able to bring this podcast to you from uh, basically the, my bedroom floor, uh, you know, I think really all these teams now, they're going to have different ways, you know, whether it's virtual classrooms, obviously through iPads and things like that, but different ways that they can try and teach their scheme, um, you know, and be able to try and get guys ready. And I think, you know, the Eagles are going to go through every single avenue possible to be able to get guys like Darius Slay and Will Parks and Javon Hargrave, all the rest of those new additions, get those guys ready and get them up to speed. You're not going to be able to replace everything that you would get from in-person you know, OTAs out in the practice field, but you can at least try and replicate as much as possible. Just get those guys ready from a mental standpoint uh, up until they're able to return to the complex, hopefully uh, at some point, you know, whether it's later this spring or early in the summer. Uh, but certainly a great question there. Every All 32 teams are facing that. Some teams a little bit more than others, though, like I said. And I think that you know the teams that uh, are not having to bring in completely new coaching staff a little bit ahead of the curve now uh, compared to some of those other ones. So uh, great question there from A-Dog. You did mention uh, uncertain times. Again, I say it every episode, but um, you know, just be safe out there. You know, Practice social distancing. Do everything that uh, all of your local officials, like I said, it's a little bit different everywhere, but make sure you're just practicing social distancing and uh, you know, we'll be able to get through all this uh, together. Hope that this podcast can be a, a little bit of a distraction for everybody uh, in the stressful time period that we're in right now. So thanks so much to A-Dog for that comment. Thanks to all of you out there for your continued support of this show and all the rest of our podcast offerings on PhiladelphiaEagles.com. All that being said, I think that'll do it. Another show in the books here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade for everybody here at the Duffy House. I'm Fran Duffy. We will talk to you next week. We will talk to you next week. We will talk to you next week.